Okay, welcome everyone, and thanks for coming. Before I introduce our speaker, uh, I just want to remind you that there is one more event in the Earth Week activities here at, uh, at the library. And on Saturday afternoon at 1.30, there'll be the award-winning documentary, uh, uh, The Biggest Little Farm. It's on uh, sustainability. So if you have an opportunity, uh, uh, you, sh you should come back on Saturday. Uh, let's see. And then I just want to let you know who our partners are uh, in putting together these Earth Week uh, uh, activities here. And, uh, and of course, uh, the main partner is uh, the library. Uh, they've been very helpful in, uh, in, in setting things up and also in uh, taping uh, the presentations. Uh, another partner is Clean Green Action. And we've been in existence since 2008. We have a number of projects that we're uh, currently w working on. Out in the lobby on the table, there's a list of all our projects and some more information uh, about our organization. And if, if you, if you, if you want to know more, you can go to our uh, Facebook page uh, or our web page. And if you're Real techie, you can just take a picture of this and you can find more information uh, on our organization. And the other partners uh, are the, the League of Women Voters here in Wisconsin Rapids and in Stevens Point. So uh, I think there's some information on, on, on the table uh, about the League also. And if you want to uh, find out more about the league. Like I said, if you're a techie, you can take, take a picture of this and it'll t t take you to some more information, so. All right, this evening we have Susan Schuller, who is the program director with Recycling uh, Connections in Stevens Point. She's an avid backyard composter with over 20 years of experience. She holds a Master's of Science in Natural Resources and a Bachelor's of Science in Biology and Chemistry and has two decades of teaching environmental education and sustainability. Uh, she has served on several boards and committees to advance environmental issues related to green schools, bird conservation, and environmental education. She is passionate uh, of connecting communities to their resources to help build a more sustainable and healthy world. So, Susan. The introduction, that was very, very nice. Um, so I am so excited to talk during Earth Week. It's one of my favorite times of the year, and we have been very busy um, this week with many outreach events. So it's very been exciting. Probably we have not had this much um, activity happening since COVID. So we're really um, amazing, like out and about with lots of events and activities. And thank you so much for having me here. Um, really, by the end of this presentation, I'm hoping you're not more confused with recycling, but I can't guarantee it. I really want us to talk about the reasons why recycling can be confusing and what is this whole talk about circular economy that you're starting to hear the shifting of the terminology change what does that mean um, so that's what we're going to talk about recycling connections has been around since 1981 we started curbside recycling in stevens point before curbside recycling was mandated 1991 is when the law was passed in the state of Wisconsin to mandate recycling in communities throughout Wisconsin. So we shifted our mission, our mission never shifted, but we shifted our focus on education and outreach. And that's primarily where we have been. Um, education and outreach for waste reduction, recycling, compost. Um, we have a really dear place for compost in all of our hearts and our staff. Um, and now we just got our newest trailer so we can start doing zero waste events, going out to places and helping them with their event recycling, waste collection, and reuse options at events. 
This is sort of the early days of recycling. We would collect um, using volunteers, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, the Stevens Point Co-op, and we had five, four or five communities, I'm sorry, counties where we were helping with recycling, either through drop-off locations or, or whatnot, and sourcing who would take these, this warehouse of <laughs> milk bottles and trying to figure out markets for it and moving the material. So it's very, very early days of recycling before it was even um, mandated. We, have, we think we're one of the first in the country. Um, New Jersey had the first law uh, across their state for recycling, uh, but Madison had a collection of newspapers before us. They started in the 1960s. We were the first one that had multiple items that we were collecting. So we have not found a community that was earlier. Uh, so we, we feel pretty, pretty proud about that. All right, so let's see first in the, in the room here. Let's test your knowledge of recycling. How much do you feel you feel pretty good about? Like, I know um, a lot about recycling, or I do not know a lot about recycling, one, if you'd put your finger up for one, or you know I'm pretty well versed in recycling. I would consider myself an expert. Where are we? Okay, okay, threes and fours, okay. Two, good. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about um, that in this presentation. How about your, the what you practice? Um, how well do you think you do? Like, I do not recycle. Okay, intervention. <laughs> Who's here? Okay, no, or I recycle everything possible. I worry about the fives in the room. I honestly do, because not everything is recyclable. So we'll talk about that too. Um, and what about others, the neighbors? So all of you are excellent recyclers. I see that from your fingers put up. But how about your neighbors? Are they, are they, what's your confidence level that they are good? Say they do not recycle one or yes, five, they recycle everything possible in your perception. Ah, we don't know, we don't know. Twos, yeah. Typically, we typically think we are really good at environmental actions where the rest of us are not. So that's usually where we fall on that. Um, but a lot of people are recycling. They all typically do care. I, I like to lean on people want to do the right thing for the most part. Um, but we hear a lot about the outlayers that make us feel less confident that we're in this together. So. Um, EPA has put out this waste management hierarchy years ago. It is supposed to be our guidance for any waste management. We are at the source. Any, when, anytime we look at how we manage our household or how we manage community waste, we need to look at source reduction. That's always the top of the hierarchy. It seems like we are flipped a little bit in this triangle, the way America deals with things, um, but Resource, um, resource reduction and reuse is supposed to be at the top. This is where circular economy is tar trying to put the focus on design of source reduction and reuse and design sector. Then we're getting into recycling compost. Just like you're seeing, recycling law came in 1991. I predict by 2030, the Wisconsin state will have a compost law of some sort. Um, that's the direction we're going. It's going to take a lot um, to make that happen, but I have, EPA has already made their goal of 50% food waste reduction by 2030. It's going along with all the climate laws you're seeing come out. This is what we have in the waste industry. Energy recovery is a, new, a newer one. Um, it's controversial because of the emissions, so it's not necessarily the top best use that we want to go to when it comes to waste. Um, and then last, should, it should go into a landfill for the health and human protect, health and environmental protection. That sometimes is the best place for items. Um, and so sanitary landfills are licensed in the state of Wisconsin, and a lot of materials are probably best suited there for safety of all of us. Um, another, a little bit more data. Uh, if you want to know much about how we are as um, humans in, this, in the United States. We produce, um, the last time this was updated was eight, um, 2018, 4.9 pounds per person per day is what we are producing 
um, as in garbage and waste in this, in this country. It's probably gone up a little bit during the COVID years. We haven't gotten the numbers yet on that. I keep watching the site to see when they're going to update that. The one thing I want to point out, though, is look at this line. This is your landfill. This is your waste. We have been able to, through diversion of materials like recycling, the compost here is not composting food waste. It's composting um, yard material. Um, and then you have combustion to energy recovery. It's staying pretty steady. It doesn't have a huge growth there. We're starting to see an uptick to landfill growth here. And then there's this weird little triangle here. Um, we're going to zoom in on that. But what I wanted to say before we move on is this land, this is landfill, and it's staying pretty steady at that point. Yes. Nope, cumulative. Is, is that personal uh, uh, waste, or is that a, how you come up with that, uh, a number of waste per person? I mean, is that like uh, yep. materials plus uh, like food uh, wrappers, or, or is it a combined? Every landfill has to weigh all materials coming in. So how they come up with this 4.9 is the fact that all of the material is weighed, the total tonnage that we are producing as Americans coming into landfills divided by the population of the US, okay? So it includes our industrial production waste, but we are driving the production of goods in this country. So we are responsible for that too of, of where it comes from, but it's not from household and dividing it up. Um, so you can't go blame your neighbor, be like, mine was only 3.1 today, and yours was six, and you're skewing the results. So you can't do that. Do you have a question as well? OK. All right, so let's get, let's get going. So the Wisconsin just did a waste characterization study. And what does that mean? Waste characterization study is literally the crane comes down, there are people that, um, that crane comes down onto the landfill, picks up a, a sample, and drops it. And you have about 30, well, probably less than 30, maybe 10 people sorting it into, I think it was 80 categories, or 82 categories of some sort. Um, so 14 landfills had this study done in one transfer station, which is a recycling, or which is a waste transfer station where material come in, comes in and then it goes out to either a recycling center or a garbage um, landfill. They sampled 398 samples by hand sorting it. Who wants that job? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love it. All right, and then um, they looked at also construction and demo material, and then they sampled it into 85 different components and then eight categories, and this is the results. What do you notice there? Law, that's why there's going to be a law in Wisconsin soon, because we, it is the largest component of material, clearly that has diversionable opportunity. Um, so we do this every 10 years or so, this study is done, so you can look back if you're really interested in digging into the data. Uh, paper and plastics, um, those are sort of hard to divert. It's not necessarily recyclable plastics. It's a lot of the way we get our, all of our packaging from frozen goods and things like that. So. Um, so the top five that it comes up to is wasted food that is formally editable. That's what the scary thing is. This could have been diverted to feed people or animals, and we didn't do it. We're not doing it. We're actually throwing out more than ever before, which is really shocking to, to all of us in the waste industry when this, these results came out. Uh, flexible film, candy wrappers, chip bags. If you thought they were recyclable, nope. There you are going in the landfill. There's not really anything um, there that's recyclable, so that's garbage, and it's very much shown in the, the study. 
Food scraps is the next one. Something you and I could do at home is actually divert it through backyard compost, and it doesn't even have to travel anywhere. If we could get more people to backyard compost, this could be addressed as well in the coming, coming years. Textiles. It's a tough one. The only textile recycler that I know of is near Milwaukee. We don't have local sources for textiles. And then compostable paper, which we can start looking at um, as possibility of diverting. But this comes down to like facial tissues. So we're going to have to have some human health issues related to this if we divert it. Yes? Um, I have a question. Um, what does textile mean? Yeah, so clothing. Your old clothing, cloth, so, uh, rags, so anything like, like text. Like people that donate things? Uh, yeah, if they, and many people are throwing them in the landfill instead. Yeah. Yep. Um, so just the cumulative data on that, in 2020 we threw away 490 uh, 1,300 tons of recyclable material that had an estimated market of 76 million in the state of Wisconsin. Um, the good thing is we do process and we do claim more than, you know, we are over 50%, but we can definitely do better at correcting our practices of what's actually getting thrown out that has value and has markets we can get this material to. Okay, so who's responsible for all this? Okay, one, and one, two, three, or four, put your fingers up. Who's responsible? Yes, we're all in the same boat, folks. So we do need legislation all the way down to individual practices to doing this. Um, what is recycling? It's a series of activities that's processing materials. Right now, what recycling does is looking at end markets and trying to divert what we can. Circular economy is a little bit different in the fact that they're looking at upstream from what is even coming down. Right now, recyclers, we're reactive. We are t seeing what people are throwing through and doing the best we can to divert what we can. But if we're working, we're not really technically working with manufacturers to design materials that are coming through that can have a market in reclaiming. A circular economy is going to look right from the very beginning at these raw materials and design, and they're going to produce it so it can keep in the cycle. All right, plastic bottles is a good example. I mean, it's designed to be recycled for the most part. Um, cans, uh, aluminum, one of the most easiest and, and um, cheapest to recycle but we're throwing plastic labels and wrapping that on the outside. That's making it, that's, that design's terrible because now it, the machines don't recognize it as metal. It's kicking these aluminum cans into plastic with optical sorters and robots that we have at some facilities to, to do this. So that was really sad to see the design, production, and manufacturing distribution um, not keeping in mind, we want the metal can to stay a metal can. Don't, don't mix it with another type of material. Two materials we can't separate. So now those are getting diverted often. Yes. Why can't you just reuse, reuse it? The reuse a the can? Plastic. Oh, they do re recycle the plastic so we can reuse as much as possible and we encourage people to do that. Yeah, there's a lot of upcycle ideas and, and things like that. See, what I do is I make like a plant out of it. Yeah, now's a the, great um, time. Earth. Now's a great time to do some planting, isn't it? So those are great. So when we look at um, the journey of recyclables, it does take all of us in the boat to get this stuff recovered. Um, and so this is, this is typically aluminum can be infinitely recycled, melted down and made into new materials. So as long as it's not mixed with labels that make it problematic. All right, so collection methods. If we understand how it's collected, you can see where the confusion comes in. We went from, anyone remember these days? Yeah. I actually still think it is the most e efficient way. But we didn't collect a lot of materials this way. It got, it got too much for households. It got overwhelming. So we went into a dual stream, which I still really like, to now single stream. 
Um, and this is where it's a little messy at the, at the material recovery facility, but we are recovering more than ever before because of it. Even though it does seem like stuff gets contaminated, the sorting equipment does get better every, every year um, to do better. And now in, the, in some of the communities, they're looking at throw it all in the garbage. We'll sort even with garbage out. I think it's a crazy idea. I think it's messy. I don't like it at all. Um, but that there is a lot of research and development going into this because we're not really doing great here. So it's like it's already coming in such a mess. So just throw it with all the garbage anyway. If we move, pull out all of the food waste anyway, it's actually cleaning up our garbage quite a bit. It's the food waste that's heavy, wet, stinky, and quite disgusting. Diapers aren't too fun either, people, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is where your recyclables go. Look at these pictures. This is a tough job. That conveyor belt is going fast. And we're going to see a picture in just a minute. Some pictures. All right, you guys have great questions. What, what if they could just throw in the ocean? Where? trash. No, we are not going to do that. Yeah, that would be deadly. And a lot of trash does get in our ocean, and it's killing our ocean animals at an incredible rate. Yeah, they probably have some filters. You'd have to go to another presentation for more details on that. <laughs> and um, why I know most of this stuff is because I'm in fourth grade. Mm -hmm. And um, so I thought half of the, like, the recycling and stuff goes in the ocean. That is not true, thank goodness. So a lot of waste gets in the ocean from wind and storms, but not half of our garbage or waste. Especially where, where we are in Wisconsin, a, a piece of recyclable would have to travel really far to get to the ocean, right? Then, so our issues is getting it, keeping it out of our streams and rivers. Then where does it go? Right here, I'll show you. A MRF. Can you say MRF? <laughs> Sounds like, oh, bless you. <laughs> Sounds like a funny name. It means material recovery facility. If this video works, um, we can see it a little bit. And this is what um, workers have to deal with each day. Oh, no, it's not going to go. Will it go? This is a material recovery center or recycling center. Your material comes onto a conveyor belt and it goes through a series of mechanical separations. Now think about this. If your materials are going through a mechanical separation, um, all these cogs are have turning and turning and turning. Oops, did I do that? I'm not gonna touch have you ever wondered what happens to your recyclables yeah, after so they're collected from your home or business? Please enjoy watching how Pelletary Waste Systems separates and prepares your recyclables so they can be shipped to end users to be made into new products. Pelletary's As recycling trucks arrive at Kip Street Station, they back into the facility and unload recyclable material onto the tipping floor. The loader then piles up the recycling. When the system needs more material to sort, the loader will grab from the pile and load it into the first piece of equipment, the metering bin. The metering bin's function is to produce a constant flow of material, which is essential to allow the sorting equipment to function properly. After the material is metered, it goes up the first conveyor and drops onto the pre-sort station. At the pre-sort station, we have several quality control people who are pulling out recyclable metal objects like pots, pans, and toasters. They're also pulling out recyclable bags of shredded paper. While pulling out these good recyclables, they're also looking for material that is not supposed to be in the recycling. Ropes, water hoses, large non-bottle plastics, trash, diapers, loose plastic bags, and clothing are sometimes found in the recycling, but are not recyclable in this system. Contaminants will often cause good recyclables to become unrecyclable, and that material will go to the landfill. It's very important to only put approved materials into your recycling container so that good recyclables are not contaminated. 
As material leaves the pre-sort station, it goes up another conveyor and drops into the old corrugated cardboard or OCC screen. As the cardboard moves across the screen, it will be touching multiple discs, allowing it to stay on top of the screen and move forward. Smaller recyclables will fall between these discs, drop down, and move on to the next piece of equipment. Under the OCC screen is a debris roll screen, which acts like a glass breaker and breaks bottled glass into quarter-sized pieces. The broken glass then falls through the debris roll screen and goes into a glass cleanup system that removes pieces of metal and other small non-glass items. After the glass and cardboard is removed, the recyclables move on to the newspaper screen. The newspaper screen uses the same concept as the OCC screen. The steep angle uses gravity to force three-dimensional objects like detergent bottles to bounce backwards and off the screen, while two-dimensional newspaper rides up and over. The third and final screen is the polishing screen. Small papers move up and over the screen onto the paper sorting platform. Gravity will cause three-dimensional materials to bounce backwards and off the back of the screen where they're conveyed onto the next process. Just after the polishing screen, we have a quality control optical sorting machine. This equipment uses light and magnets to identify any metal or plastic material that is flattened enough to act like a piece of paper and remain in the paper stream. Once this material is identified, it is hit with a shot of air and removed from the paper stream so that it can go on to be sorted with all the other plastic and metals. At this point, we have a quality control station to look for any paper that has gotten through the screens. Generally, this would be three-dimensional paper products like phone books, balled up paper, or juice and milk cartons. These materials are pulled and sorted. Now that all papers have been sorted out of the recyclables, they go to the paper platform. There are several stations where people are removing contaminants, okay, such as plastic films or trash from the paper. By the time the paper the gets slide. to the end of the conveyor, it will meet the paper. So this is All that's left a video in the that you can watch further if you want. It's Pelletary. They're out of Madison. Um, and uh, they, they are, we don't have that nice of a facility. Our, our stuff does not go to Madison. Um, it gets sorted. It was sorted in Plover. There's some changeover right now with operations. So our materials are currently going down to um, Wisconsin, to Whitewater, uh, to John's disposal at the moment. Um, this is the type of, of information that you, a lot of you took some flyers of. Because a lot of people, when you, know, when you see the Material Recovery Center, you can see why we can't accept everything in there. What happens to things like this? Do you see how this would have been problematic in, there, in that system? These cords are wrapped around all that machinery that's always moving. Plastic bags are cut out every day they have to shut down the equipment, cut out plastic bags because they're, they're in there. Um, you saw the guy actually open a plastic bag and shake out the materials. That typically does not happen. If there is a bag materials in it, they're going to pull it out and maybe they'll get to sorting it. Oftentimes they just don't have the staff or the time to do it. That's heavy labor. So they want the things loose in your bin for that reason. Other question? Um, they did that because in some videos they had to short it out, like short it, like probably, like let's say you were just watching that one and how you said they like took the bag and short through it. They only did that so they can like like go on to the next part. Of maybe, the thing. maybe I don't know how they yeah, did that. Me yeah, either. yeah. Um, so your waste and the way that your um, materials are going, they're our materials in central Wisconsin are coming to, you'll either go straight to the landfill in Rapids, you have a landfill, um, or the transfer station. And at the transfer station, materials are separated from, and part of the materials will go to the recycling center. And anything left coming into the transfer station, there's still some landfill items that are still coming in there. And then we're finding markets for it. So... Um, specific markets. Your paper and cardboard, in fact, I encourage you all just to drop it off at the, at the deposit. Um, right, at, right at the mill, you're literally putting paper onto a conveyor belt. That is 
direct source recycling, which is amazing. You still have it. I bring our materials over here um, from Stephen's point. Then any materials of HDPE, um, which is high density polyethylene, uh, ones and twos are going to lower Michigan. Those are your bottles. Anything with a neck on it. So your plastics, these are the most easily recyclable item, and we will always use it now by shape. We don't like to say the numbers because recycling no ones and twos are now getting into blends, and the numbers just are telling you what resin of plastic it is that's in it. It is not telling you it's recyclable. They use that symbol for the plastic industry just so they know what plastic is in there chemically. So that's what those symbols are. Um, but it's used as a universal symbol for, for recycling, and it's unregulated. So any manufacturer can put it on any product because chemically, any of those things are technically recyclable. Acceptable locally? No. But there is a little better rating system they do have now where please recycle me symbols. Those are the better ones to use, but still... It's confusing. Did you have a question in the back? It's so simple. Do we put, leave the lids on? Yes, please. Leave the lids on. That was the question. Do we leave the lids on? Yes. Caps on. Yeah, so there are some laws coming out to try to regulate the symbol more. And that would be great because it would be better for us consumers to be better about that. So yeah, that question was about the um, using the symbol for recyclables and if manufacturers are going to allow to do it. Of course, California is leading the way in all of this and really getting pushing, um, getting some movement on that. I, it won't come at a federal level anytime soon because it's not good for business, you know, and they can, it, I don't want to accuse all the greenwashing, but there's a lot of greenwashing out there and it drives me crazy. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, do they, is like bottle glasses, like technically still, um, Still, um, glasses like this? Yeah. Yep. Recyclable. Do they, do they still go in recyclable? Yep. Yep. Yeah, glasses accepted any color. So glasses utilized locally for the most part. Um, aluminum's going to Kentucky, steel's going to eastern Wisconsin, um, and then our garbage from uh, the transfer stations then sort sort material and either go to the landfill or the recycling center. So that's where your materials are going, if you were ever curious. Um, and really, when we look at, at circular economies, recycling does play into this quite a bit. And here's some of your common items of what they will become. So the milk jugs become furniture. This is very common. So this is your, um, your really rigid plastics. Um, milk jugs become more rigid plastics and made into forms of all sorts of things. Um, cardboard is any cereal box, and you can see that the, it's messy. If you look on the inside of a cereal box, there's all sorts of contaminants and stuff in there. Lots of plastics are made into, um, is mixed in with it um, because of all our label systems, but it's made into um, another material for that. Our tin is made into a lot of different manufacturing, um, piping, and all sorts of things, or it could become back into a new tin. Plastic bottles is, com becomes carpet, or it could become a fleece is common for, for plastic bottles to be made into thread, which is really still like, I'm still trying to think of how that works, but don't ask me. It's another presentation. Um, your plastic bags, although they're not to be put in your recycling bin, your curbside, they can be recycled at the grocery stores. And those get made into typically decking material. Um, and you can push this industry by buying um, the plastic decking material, too. It's really nice. Um, I'm surprised how well that lumber holds up, especially in our environment. It's quite good. 
So questions over here. I'm so sorry. Um, but my mom right there, she she reuses her bags. Like That's if good. we went to Walmart and we had bags, we would keep them and go back to Walmart and use them. Yeah. Or like use them awesome. for like diaper bags or anything. Yeah. Well, not like actual diaper bags. I was going to ask. Like, I hope it's not a used diaper. I mean like, like, yeah. like, like put like a... Like a dirty diaper in the bag and then put it in the trash. Yep, so that's good. So it's not stinking the trash up. Okay, that's good. Um, a lot of your your bottles, last one I had here was uh, that that the bottles that you see come turn it, get turned into lots of different toys too. So if you're looking for gifts and things like that, do check to see if it is recycled, made of recycled material. You're going to push that industry ev even further to show that consumer demand when you're asking for content that was recycled content. Um, a few more stats here I don't want to get too much into, um, but, but aluminum cans really are very, very, very recyclable. Uh, you can keep, especially on the, t on the soup cans and stuff, it's okay to keep the paper on the outside. That does get burned off and there's no contamination or issues with that. So that is a question on that. Um, historically, we would say take it off. If you take it off, there's no problem there either. But it really is not causing any issues with the reprocessing to leave it on. So for convenience, you can leave it on. Just we ask that you do a good rinse of your, um, of your tins, if you will. Again, it's, you see this, the, there's a lot of humans touching your materials. So if you think about, okay, what kind of product is my recyclables in? Another human's going to touch this. Would you want to touch it? If you wouldn't want to touch it, then put it in a condition where somebody who it's going to, you know it's going to be exposed to other people. Um, energy savings uh, by recycling steel here in the United States could produce enough electric power to use by 18 million homes every year if we just recycled all of our steel. We recycle a lot of it, but that's the benefits that we're seeing, that equivalent to it, which is pretty cool. And the less energy used to produce a good for the good is fewer greenhouse gases, period. So the more we can reuse and be efficient, it's just being smarter. It's about efficiency with, with our um, recycling, and it does save a lot of energy to do so, as opposed to producing more raw material. For instance, we don't have any place where we can get aluminum in, the, in North America. It's all shipped from overseas, mostly from Australia. The more we can recycle our aluminum and keep it here in the United States and reuse it, reuse it, reuse it, because it can be recycled over and over and over. Unlike plastics, they start to degrade. Unlike fibers and paper, they start to degrade over time. Um, the quality decreases, but tins and aluminum is almost infinite to melt down and reuse. Yeah. So the Metelco plant, that was just built in Rapids. Mm -hmm. Is there any connection with them? They're an Ooh. aluminum producer, correct? I don't know, but this is exciting for me to learn. Really? <laughs> yeah, so it's there's about, a... it's about two years old, but it's okay. an aluminum factory based out of Canada, I believe. So it's... now I want to know if our materials are now coming here instead. Um, that's that's quite possible. So thank you. Again, new markets are always popping up or closing, and ah, keeping up with that is, is tough for people because it changes the way we recycle. And to get that education to the people, it's always lagged when that change happens. Um, nationally, job creation and recycling uh, is 10,000 tons of material creates 10 jobs, while landfilling it creates only one. I mean, you just look at that from an economic job, job creation. Recycling is a $236 billion um, industry a year. So really does make a lot of sense for us to invest in our recycling systems and pr practice that. Um, if you're interested in why you go and travel and they're, they're terrible at recycling, well, there's not laws everywhere. Um, Almost, you know, half the states don't have a law to recycle. And in Wisconsin, that is something that really is hard for us to understand because <laughs> we think it's crazy. 
Um, but there's a lot of states that do not have it mandatory. So that's why when you travel or when you have people moving in, you're always saying, no, that's not right. And I've, I've had many domestic disputes I've had to like resolve <laughs> for them. And I was like, oh, don't tell me your husband is this and you want me to tell you an answer. <laughs> But um, you can see why that is. It, it all depends where you live and where your markets are, where the, uh, the manufacturing industries are that would take the material and efficiency related to that. So that's why it's not universal. The, con the country did not pass a universal law, and I don't think they ever will. It's about state control and you know having the, them decide what's best there. In the state of Wisconsin, we actually have one of, in the 1990s, it was one of the most extreme um, recycling laws, very surprising for the day. A lot of states have now caught up or far exceeded us um, in, in their recycling laws. But these are all the materials that cannot even go into the landfill. You're going to see some of this and you're like, but I saw that waste characterization had a lot of paper. Well, it's not like we're going to, it's not enforced lawful enforcement, but this is generally every community of a certain size has to provide a collection and diversion for all of these things. I mean, tires, they do not go in the landfill. And they will, landfills will reject people if they see any tires coming on a load or when they're dropping it off. Um, so you'll see a lot of um, these, these are what we have passed where communities have to provide programming to divert it, um, so, so we all have this. And then they also have to do some education and outreach. Uh, a little thing on plastics here, currently only plastic containers one and two are actually banned, not all plastic containers. So a little bit, uh, anything like plastic bottles are banned from our landfills. But they're not gonna regulate all of our household waste to do that. Um, there's just not the, the manpower to do that. Big things on the issues, uh, the big issues we're seeing in landfills right now. Oh, if we can figure out mattresses. There's one mattress recycler in Wisconsin. They're down by La Crosse. I love them. They are really amazing. But for us to load up mattresses and take them down there, it's just not economical yet. But um, there's one fella that's on our board that works very closely with Seven Rivers, and they're the mattress recycler. So there might be possibilities we can get a, in the central Wisconsin, get a big truck that can be put out um, by a furniture store and any mattresses that are brought in or when you buy a new mattress, they might be able to, we might be able to create a deal. I don't know if people are going to be willing to pay 40 or $50 to recycle their mattress though. That's the other tough thing. Um, there is a cost for all of this to ship that um, trailer down. To them. Um, vape, vaping pens here, you know, it's a really uh, big thing, but every vape pen has a lithium ion battery in it. Lithium ion batteries catch fires. Every day there's a fire in a landfill because lithium ion batteries. Maybe not from a vape pen, but from, from some other things, batteries that have gotten thrown away. And it's, it's a real problem and actually more of a safety hazard now that we have so many more electronics coming into our lives. And we really don't have effective ways of um, managing them. But we, and they don't take them back. They don't have buyback programs. So it's, it's, it's going to be a real challenge for our society to figure these out because it's also, it comes with a big hazard um, on that. What we're working on in, in Recycling Connections is, I mentioned earlier, our zero waste services. So trying to even get into, we don't say zero waste because we know there's no such thing as zero waste. So we try to say near zero, striving for zero. Um, and that is doing what we can at events to divert as much material as possible at that event. So at Energy Fair, the, Mid the Midwest Renewable Energy Fair, we're at to help with their zero waste efforts trying to even control what's coming in in order for us to be able to manage it well um, for us on the other end as well. Consultation, we are work on div food diversion. Like I said, it's compost season for us. So it's all about food right now in backyard composting. Uh, we have a living low uh, lifestyles, trying to get more people to think about every product they have 
Um, and we did this little pilot of a reuse container with restaurants, um, having a, a voluntary return um, container program with a few restaurants. And it just hasn't launched yet, but we're still working on that and hopeful that we can get something going there. Um, and that's me. Uh, Central Wisconsin Recycling Collective is probably one of your better options for knowing what's recycled locally. So this is a consortium between Marathon County, Portage County, um, and, and Recycling Connections. And we do have partners in, ever, in neighboring counties where our waste shed is. We call it a waste shed, like a watershed. So we, we're following where our waste trail is. So all of our materials coming in, we do education and outreach. And this would be very relevant to Rapids as well for our social, and it's more or less a social media campaign, having tips on YouTube, one minute clips on what, how to recycle right. Uh, we're on Facebook and Instagram. We have an info line and we have an um, email address where we answer questions of people that they wanted to ask. Yes. Yeah. I almost hate to, to, to bring this up and ask this, but I know that it, I've come up against it with, you know, when I mentioned it here, I'm talking about recycling. Mm -hmm. So there are videos out there that are talking about, um, when you talk about um, that brokers are buying our, that brokers are buying our, um, like, bundled up, Plastics and they're mm -hmm. being shipped, got by the container shipping overseas over to, especially, um, you know, Asian, markets. Um, you know, a Southeast Asia and that part of the world. And then they are just being burned or just, you know, I mean, it's filling up their waterways and things like that. So, um, what yeah. do you say to that? Yeah, no, I, um, I don't know if you heard of the China, um, uh, the, the. Oh, what sword? The chi China closed their doors on U.S. recyclables. You know, the whole... That just went other it did go a little further south, but China closing their doors really stopped a lot of the majority of what U.S. was coming. There's still going to be markets in Southeast Asia that's going to take it. Um, and it all comes down to what we were putting in those containers. When you're... On the top five contaminants of recyclables in our stream is a dirty diaper. And I'm not kidding. Like they, It's in the top five of what these sorters are getting on their re recycling lines. Diapers are every day, every day. Uh, one of the funniest ones was bear claws by real bear claws put in the recycling bin and came across on the thing. They're always pulling crazy things out. Um, but that was all going into all of our bales that, you know, all the, you can't pull everything out. And it was just trash. China finally said no. Southeast Asia said, we'll take it and sort it out. But you're pretty much giving us garbage. So what should have gone in the landfill here in the United States, we are shipping it out. And they are doing the best to sort it. But a lot's going to be just landfill items because that's what we're sending them. So those brokers that are in that business, it's really frustrating because it does give recycling a bad name. I like that China said stop. It's pushing the U.S. to deal with our own stuff. And um, it's pushed markets and it's pushed us to develop and invest more in recycling systems in the United States, which does do much better for us. It produces jobs, as you saw. If we can invest in jobs and recycling, which aren't as bad as a... Well, I guess landfill jobs are not terrible either, um, but they're just hard watching everything that's coming through. You know, over time, I, I work with all these landfill uh, managers, and they really are the, some of the most amazing people because they see what's coming, what we're throwing away. And you can only pull so many bikes out of the landfill and say, I'm going to save this one, you know, <laughs> and put it in either scrap metal or something. But the the amount is so much you you can't even fathom it and the tonnage they they see in a day, um, and legally you're not supposed to once it hits the garbage can it's now legally 
destined for the landfill, and there's not a lot you can do about it for, for that. So, but it does happen, and but it's happening a lot less because of the China closing their doors to our, to our recycles and being very stringent on the quality coming in. Um, and so that's been probably the best thing they could do for us, even though it really really shook us when that first happened. We were like, what are we going to do? And it stockpiled all the stuff. Markets crashed of the value of it and everything, and the pricing plummeted, plummeted. And we just had no places. There wasn't enough industries developed in the United States to take the stuff. So uh, 2018, I want to say, um, 2017 possibly. So, um, but glad, I'm very glad they did. Um, but that's this is great tips to learn. So if you are on any of these social medias, you're going to get tips on that. Um, other things, we are looking for volunteers to help at the Energy Fair with our zero waste services. You can get involved with us and help out if you want to volunteer there. We're also going to be up at Project North uh, Music Fest in Rylander in September. And that was a, that's a new zero waste event for us. So we're very excited to be providing services there, doing education and outreach at these events and helping people recycle, write, compost um, correctly and know what to throw, you know, what ultimately it does get thrown away. Um, how about a pop quiz? Now that you learned all of this great stuff, I'm going to test your knowledge. All right, so what do you think on here? Is lo and we're talking local recyclability. What on here is recyclable? Nothing. None of this stuff will be accepted locally for recycling. The plate is going to be contaminated with food. They don't want it. Styrofoam is just ridiculous. Um, and then the silverware, why didn't you bring your own? Come on. Don't you have your silverware in your purse or in your pocket when you go to events? Come on, people. Get with the circular economy. If you're not yet, you're, you're really falling behind. Okay. Cans and tins, I'm just putting them together because they go in the same spot. Yay, recycle where? Curbside or drop off? Yeah, you can curbside those. Okay, what about a form plastic? It's got the recycling symbol and I think there's a seven in here. But it has the recycling symbol. And it says recycle me. Come on. Yeah, so this is garbage. Um, you know, they're fooling us when they, we do this. First of all, it's a seven, and very, very few communities would take the blended seven. Seven is miscellaneous plastic resin. So it doesn't fit in the resin codes of one, two, three, four, five, six, which actually are a very specific molecular plastic. And then they all are heated down at certain temperatures. And that's why when we get into blends, it's kind of messing plastics up even more than they are messed up. Um, sevens are the catch-all category, so really if it says seven, it's really saying just garbage. Um, I don't like going by the numbers, but, but this, and it is so funny because they're like, please recycle this carton. And they have the symbol that says seven and recyclable. It's garbage. Anything with a form, pretty much, um, for that. Not locally. If you live in Milwaukee, Chicago, Madison, or Minneapolis, you can. So if you have, you did not hear this from me, but if you have friends that live down there, we literally transport our clamshells to, <laughs> to my parents, and we kind of like arrive at mom and dad's, and I empty my recyclables at my parents. But you did not hear that from me, so... <laughs> And landfilled. Yeah. Yep. So you can wish cycle it away for it to go into landfill when it gets down to, for us, white water right now. I, that is going to change a little bit because the contracts are going to change. It's just temporary for who's going to take over the plover site. Um, and I don't know what's going to happen with that. That's going to be too, um, be continued on that one. How about this? This curbside recycling. Yep. Good job. Okay, what about this tub, though? 
Keep forever, yes, it's a scoop, it's a planter, it's a, <laughs> you name it. There you go. Is this accepted curbside, do you think? It is. It's actually recycled too. So something you would like, you know, one positive for this. Yeah, it looks like a form. Um, these containers, sour cream, things like that, they are. You can keep the lid on them um, and then they can be put in your curbside. These are typically a five, but again, I don't like to go by the numbers anymore. I like to go by shapes and that's what you're going to see in the handout. The shapes is what matters. Um, let's say glass. We have two types of glass. One's colored glass, one has a metal lid. What do we do with this? What do you do with the metal lid? Do you just leave it, that flat lid in the recyclables? As you saw, that how it will get jammed up in the cogs. Okay, you can recycle this curbside. Yes, pro tip, take it off. Go the extra mile and put it in your tin can to anything flat acts like paper in the machines. If you saw that, this is pretty light and you see that metals are sorted last. This is likely going to contaminate a paper load. Um, maybe it will get into the plastics, but metals are kind of sorted at the end of lines and typically this is going to get chucked into something before it gets to the metal. So pro tip. Put it in your tin, tin can when you have that, um, any of the tomato cans or something like that and crimp that shut. That's what we were talking about bottle caps before you came in. Bottle caps is another one. Too small to really put in your machinery. It was, it's going to jam up or fall through the machines. But you can put it in a tin can, crimp it to secure it so tin is with tin. Likes are with likes. You can do that with plastic caps as well with plastic bottles. Um, so in my containers here, I sometimes have like plastic caps on random things like a applesauce container comes with a plastic lid. I'll put the lid in here, pro tip, put it in, it's contained, likes with likes, it's going to get sorted with the plastics. Up here? Yeah. Um, this isn't a big deal. Um, that can be on there. Uh, that, that's, you can cut it off if you want. And I was with a friend from Europe, and apparently you're supposed to actually pull, you twist this and pull it off. And I'm like, oh, I never knew that. Um, I always just, I don't know, cut the piece and take it off and do my cork or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's not a problem if it's, it's going to be sorted out. That's going to ultimately be landfilled or you can rip it off and put it in landfill. But the manufacturing plant where it goes for melting down um, glass, it will come out in the melting down process. So it's not a big deal for them. Yeah, garbage just for the safety of the workers. Now they might be exposed to some broken glass anyway as stuff coming through, but we are trying to minimize it. So if you have broken glass, just please put that in the garbage for the safety of any of the haulers or anyone else that could come into contact with through the movement process. And any color is acceptable? Yeah, any color is acceptable now. Yep, no problem, yeah. Papers, this one's kind of, these are kind of glossy. What do you do with glossy papers? They'll recycle them, yeah. The mill can take these, no problem. Nope, garbage. Yeah, too much ink and stuff in there. They don't want any of, of that. All right, plastic bags. Sure, yo, good job. Okay, special drop off. What about cords? And we're getting lots of them if you've noticed. Open like your junk drawer. Just count how many cords you have in this thing. Oh my gosh. It's getting overwhelming in my life. What would you do with these? I would recycle it. Metal recycling. Can I just throw it in my curb then? Nope. Yeah, why, why don't we put it in the curb? It tangles in the machines, and you have to literally cut it out of the machines, and they pull it out and break it down. Yeah. What about VCR tapes and LCDs? Oh, so sorry. Landfill. No, but yep. I put it here. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, I'm glad you want to hear it. <laughs> Garbage. Um, what about these? You know, these tubes are coming out, and you know, even Tom's is like, yeah, this is recyclable. There's metal in here. There's plastic on the outside. There's probably gunk still in here because I can't squeeze it enough. What would you do with this? Garbage. Garbage, garbage, garbage. No matter how much they say flexible plastic is recyclable. Flexible plastic is my demise. And I had, I had little kids, and those squirt things are about drove me crazy when you go to a soccer match and they give all the squirt plastic things that they're like gone in two seconds and then the whole tube is just so much garbage for such a little amount of food that was in there. But sorry, soapbox oh, off. Like okay. Yeah, yeah, I've tried those and actually they're too big. I'm like, there's a lot of stuff in this. Oh my goodness, it's really foaming. So yeah, I just break some of those apart. I did t um, try some of them and I like it. Um, so that's kind of cool too. You can make your own too. Okay, this is plastic with a pump. Debate. Oh, what do we do? The whole thing is recyclable. It's totally fine to put in with, again, it's a cap on, keep the pump. Yes, there's a little bit of metal in here. That's okay. Um, what happens with plastic recycling, why we can put caps on now, is the plastic um, comp the pa plastic manufacturers, it gets all bailed up in a big bale with the caps on typically or with caps if they got messed up in the sorting ma um, machines and bailed up. Then they go through massive shredders. The caps are made of one plastic that floats. The, pl the other plastic actually sinks or vice versa. Um, and then they do use water separation from the shredded plastic and then they pelletize that and then that goes to two different manufacturers from there. So there's like a couple processes. Yeah, it's super, super interesting for those. So we can curbside that. And our takeout container, that's black and, wait. Yeah, reuse or throw it out. Or take it to Chicago. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, landfill. So there's a little like surprise package that someone brought and they wanted me to sort this for them. So we're going to do that now. Maybe you can help me. Garbage. Wow, look at these pros. Recycle, Recycle curb size, no problem. Gosh, this one is. Um, I'm sorry, this is plastic. Good question because it looks metal from, from where you're at. You know, I would probably, um, I would probably recycle this one. It is that normally de um, deodorant is not, but she did a really good job of like, there is nothing left in here. I think she washed this out. So if you do this good of a job with your deodorant, um, yeah, go ahead. And, and it's clear and it's, it's like a bottle shape. I like this bottle shape, not the other ones. Those are going to get pulled out or trashed. Um, we know this one, garbage, same thing. Even though it doesn't have the metal plastic, it's a, it's a garbage. And then we're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. It's a glass bottle with a metal thing and a plastic tip. What did we talk about multi-material items? Because this has three types of material in it, it's garbage. So multi-material items that are difficult to separate, garbage. Now we've got this one, and this one's not as pretty. Plastic little tube. This is likely, I, I would throw this in the garbage, and it's not, it's barely passing what we call a fist test. Anything smaller than a fist will not get through that machinery. Um, so this is really getting to the category of just too small. It's actually going to probably more likely cause a problem. I mean, this is getting pretty close. So, um, but look at the, you know, look at that difference. This is more like a bottle. I would trash that. And then same thing here. Too little. What's our pro tip for this little metal thing? 
same stuff. So if you can get this in some type of aluminum, this could get separated with aluminum. But aluminum's tough. Tins are much easier, tin to tin. I don't think this is tin, though. This is feeling aluminum-ish, but um, I don't know. Is that, is that glass? This is glass. You can take the plastic cap off because then you have likes with likes. Okay? okay. <laughs> I'm trying to be a pro. Um, reuse this too is a possibility. So, and then it looks like there's a little cap garbage. Your solid waste comes. Our, our items from to say, look, I know that this isn't really recyclable, mm -hmm. and that you need to do better. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm your consumer. I'm your market. You know, I want materials that are really actually recyclable. Or box them up and send it back to them, saying, "You deal with my waste because you gave me waste." So. so. Terracycling, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, terracycling is pretty interesting. It's a little bit debated in our solid waste industry because some of their boxes are great. You know, they're at, they, they've, they've partnered with BIC, and BIC is funding boxes to be shipped, and they give you a shipping label, for instance. So you, there's not a cost to the consumer for doing some of these programs because industry is supporting their um, product. But TerraCycle now has zero waste boxes, and you can put anything that, any of these items, you just put it all in the box. You pay for the shipping to it. I, I can't believe they can find and sort this into reclaiming everything. Um, so I'm not doing, I wouldn't trust the zero waste box, even though I love TerraCycling, and I do like the companies that are trying to find solutions for it. Um, shipping is still falling on too many of the boxes. It's still falling on the consumer. Or they have to collect. Like we had the Boston School Forest was collecting all of the Capri Suns. And I was talking to the director, and she's like, there's just, there's so many Capri Suns bags, like, in our storage because we have to collect so much to fill this box that she's like, we can't even get there in like two years and we're, there's lots of, um, there's still liquid in there and it stinks and it's just like, so they just, they had throw it out because they can't store it, they can't collect enough fast enough for it to ship before it starts rot, getting some rottening stuff in there. So it's tough, you know, it is, it gives us an option and I do, I, I like the company a lot but it's still not close to us. It's going to often California, New Jersey, and maybe Pennsylvania is where their TerraCycling sites are. So it's still not in our climate change um, efficiency for actually justifying the shipment of that item and having more, more emissions from the transport of the item than the reclaimable material that's even in there. You have to think about that. That's a, it. Some of it's best put in the landfill because there's not a market and source for it. So, yeah. Your surprise box itself were, I'm always conflicted with the cardboard box itself where it has oh. a lot of plastic and tapes and things on it. Not a problem? Pla like, are you talking you know, tape? Like, like that? They yeah. They don't have a plastic ring on the outside where your packing slip is in or there's... Oh, yeah. No, and that's not a big deal. Um, of course, the paper mills want fiber. But remember how the pulpers work. This fiber goes right into a vat of water, hot, hot, hot water. And then they have this big old, if you've ever been to the paper mill, it's really interesting. And then they have this really big stirrer, and it's pulling. It literally pulls all, like, the tapes out of it. So it makes, it's pretty dirty, but it's fine. And it's designed to be able to pull those plastic labels out, and it's not 
a big deal. They know they're going to, no, it's not a problem. If you have excessive tape, do the mill a favor and pull some of that out. Um, this is not a big deal. Uh, this is totally fine. Uh, <laughs> why are you asking me this? Bubble wrap is the same as bags. So bubble wrap can go with your drop off at your grocery store. Um, your peanuts, garbage. I guess they're making some of these peanuts where they dissolve though. My kids thought that was really fun and they saw it on YouTube that they could eat it. And I saw them like with little bags. I'm like, stop eating those. Those are not, they're like, they're cornstarch, mom. It's really, and I was like, no, no, they're more than cornstarch in there. You're going to die. <laughs> so we stopped that practice. Hmm. Yeah. The cheap label on the outside. Mm -hmm. I know, and it's such a pain. To, it is true. Exactly. It kind of drives me nuts with the microbrew world, and these are annoying. So, why are these annoying to me? So this is the six pack, microbrew six pack um, carrier. Microbrew six pack carrier. Oh, well, good. So you don't have to worry about this. <laughs> I like my microbrews. <laughs> um, yep, it's flat. So what did we see in the video? What happens with flat light material? It floats, it flies, it goes with the blowers. It's going to be mixed with what? Paper. So these are contaminating paper loads like crazy. Um, and so, and, and they do such a good job because they have a lot of space here to put recycle me on it. Um, so take these back to the microbrewer. A lot of them are taking them back and they can reuse them. So do check with their local brewer if they will take them back. Center Waters um, is supposed to. I have a big box for them and I have yet to try that so far, but I do need to take that back to them so they can reuse them. You do? Because think about that. It's not the same. It's not a like-to-like. -like. And aluminum, that the way those optical sorters are reading the can, it's reading plastic on the outside. Yeah. So it's shooting that to the, it's not, yeah. So if you can become a label peeler or, you know, try to go with the ones that are using the spray labels because that whole wrap and the shrink wrap, you're seeing it on cleaners. You're seeing it, I mean, that's a plastic bottle to a plastic label, so not as big of a deal because it's all going to a plastic industry, but it's the different um, plastics. But the cans, and that kills me because the cans, aluminum cans, so recyclable, and now you've wrapped it with a plastic wrap, and if you don't remove that, it's unlikely that it's going to actually get sorted right at the machine. Um, and I don't know what, like, um, when you donate it to... Well, it's all going to the, the, the recycling center for sorting, for like Habitat for Humanity or whoever, you know, gets the boys, the Boy Scouts get that. Um, yeah. I don't know if that's on. We might have lost our sound. Yeah, that's another one that's getting pretty. So she asked about the one cup yogurt containers. Single serving is really problematic. Um, I do put them in my curbside because they are a little bit bigger than that, that fist size. It is getting sort of on that uh, zone of unacceptability. And now you're also seeing that the single serving yogurts, if you do like um, some yogurt containers are that thicker plastic and some are super thin kind of using the garbage plastic, that probably won't get through and reused. Um, so I think Yoplait switched their yogurt containers, and now you have single-use yogurt containers that are all made differently, and it's really hard to educate on that one. Um, so if it's the thinner plastic, it's likely garbage. If it's the thicker single-use um, yogurt container, it's probably accepted in your curbside. 
That's the best I can say. Or you could wish cycle it if you want. Just throw it in your recycling and wish it to be recycled. Not a practice we totally want people to do, but when you're not, you're not totally sure, it makes you feel a little better. Definitely. Yeah, and the more we can think a little bit more. It's not totally bulk, but if you can do that, that is that's it is the better option. It's more certain. So, you guys had so many questions. Yeah, go for it. No, like garbage. These so you can try it. Um, send that to my yard nope, 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 not at all. It's garbage. Anytime it says compostable and it's made of a corn product or manufactured one way or another, garbage. Sorry. Okay. Um, we're working with Bucket Ruckus and White Feather Organics um, for the Energy Fair, and we're working with Sue's up in Wausau for the Project North. So both of them are composters. They do take some of those single-use um, compostable paper fiber products, but if it's clear and it's made of that corn product, that will never break down. Um, so, but if it's the fiber one, the one other thing you have to watch with some of these single use um, products is if they are PFAS free. Have you heard of the PFAS debate? PFAS is a forever chemical that we have been using since the 1940s. About 99, 98% of us have PFAS in our blood system. The good thing is when we reduce our exposure to PFAS, it does get out of our system, but we are exposed at such a level that it's used in everything, it's gonna take a long time for our society to be phasing the use of PFAS out. And if you followed the Teflon story, um, Teflon was a PFAS, um, they were using PFAS product, which is a polyurethane fluoro chlor um, chlorine chemical. And it's a very specific chemical and it's used in, there's, 40, it's, there's over 4,000 chemical components that are chemical, um, um, chemicals used that have PFAS, that particular molecule in them. That's we've been using forever. <laughs> I know. So uh, if it says BPI free, you're getting better because that doesn't ha use any PFAS with BPI free. So you can kind of look at that label. You're seeing, and you'll see it in stores, more PFAS free, especially on pans because cooking pans got such a big rap on this PFAS issue. You're seeing PFAS in all of um, up, up north where they had the fighting um the firefighting foam plant, that was, that's all PFAS that's used for um, sequestering or like cutting down all fires. So it's very effective and there's places where it is its best use chemical to use in things like fighting fires, but <laughs> it gets in our water. And because there was a plant there, they did a lot of testing and it got um, up in Peshtigo areas where they where they have real problems with drinking water. Wausau is now having some issues with their water. Anywhere you test, you're gonna have PFAS. So it's complicated to, from our solid waste industry, we're sort of like, ooh, don't pass regulation too much and too, too um, watch the levels of where you're going to regulate it because it's, the manufacturers are not stopping the production. So it's still coming into our environment because you're not stopping it up, you're not stopping the tap. But you're telling wastewater treatment plants, your water, your water um, cleaning plants and then your landfills to clean all this stuff. Well, you're not stopping it from coming to us. So now we will be paying for the treatment of it while manufacturers pump it down the line. And so we really have to look at this holistically. No, you're already exposed to it. No, we're already living with this. Um, but we do need to, that's probably my phone up there, sorry. Um, but we do need to get it phased out, just like we did with um, PCBs and things like that. 
Um, but Oh, good. Oh, good. Is it what? What's the issues in um, rapids or how they're talking about this stuff? Okay, good. Good. Your levels are not too high then. Yeah. My question is: You talked about zero waste at some events. Are you? Available as a consultant to mm -hmm. for large events. Yep. For example, we have the state water ski show here, and it's just oh, a yeah. huge amount of recycling, <laughs> composting opportunity, yeah. and landfill opportunity. But I think that they would welcome uh, the advisement. So they would just right. pay you a fee then as a yeah, consultant? Yeah, it's free to talk about it. So free okay. first, like a first meeting, we'll come to and, you know, and talk, talk to you about, you know, best practices, what you can think about. If you want to do it yourself, there you go. If you want us, um, right now the Lakes Convention is going on in Stevens Point, and they pay us to set up their, to certify their event as near zero waste. So we came in, we worked with their facilities to divert all of their food waste. So we brought, we use bucket ruckus for their buckets. Um, we educate the staff on what to put in there. And then we run a report at the end of how much food was diverted. We relabel um, all of their waste containers to be landfill, recycling with appropriate colorization and signage. Um, that's clearly marked because the Holiday Inn just has really beautiful recycling and garbage that look exactly the same. And they're like copper writing with a dark, you know, container so you can't read it really well. So we, we set up their station so they have recycling, trash, um, and, and compost. And then there's a fee for that. They're just $300. We, we certify their event for that and divert their material and energy fair, they do pay a fee for us to come in and do their full servicing with staff on the ground educating. So there's different three different levels we, we work with folks. But to, yeah, just give us a call. Um, actually, the Corn Fest in Sun Prairie, they, they kind of have us on the, their planning team. We're not servicing it. We're not doing any waste, but they're doing a, we're doing advisory for them too. And we can do that. Hmm. Okay. How big is it? The fifth test on those. Fifth test on those. So the prescription bottles sometimes are bigger and they can go in your recycling. If it's smaller than the fifth, the small ones, just they're likely not, they're, they're going to likely be more problem than they will get through. If they're smaller than a fifth, just throw them out. Oh no, those are so garbage. <laughs> the Dixie cups, your what I like to say the beer cups, the college beer cups, yeah. garbage. Garbage. Yeah, if it's medicated, yes. If it's vitamins, if it's they, that's that's um, can go in your regular trash. Even the vitamin itself, just crush it up, put it in your trash itself. But if it's medicated, that needs to go to the um, drop off. Yeah. Yep. Good. Good. Excellent questions tonight. I love these conversations. So thanks so much for coming out tonight and. Um, appreciate your interest in um, doing better. You know, we all can can do better. So, yeah, you bet.